uh, when a plateau happens, you know, we always say you have to sort of shake things up a little bit. So um, the problem when you plateau is that what you're doing and what your body is doing has now reached an equilibrium. So your body always reacts to what you're doing. That is the normal process of homeostasis. That is, if you adjust something, your body adjusts differently. So just like if you go into a, a you know, a concert, and it's really, really loud, right? It's, uh, well, you get used to it after a little bit, or you go into a dark room, you know, gets, you get used to it and then you go into the sunlight. It's like, whoa, it's so bright. So your body is always adjusting and that happens for everything. So it happens if you change your diet too, right? You can change into a really good diet. You can still plateau. I mean, we all know that, right? You eat what you think is a great diet or, and, and it's doing great. And then you plateau. So same thing with the fasting, it, it can happen as well. So in that case, there's sort of several ways that you can go. You can either just continue and hope that things will get better. And sometimes it does. I, I don't say that it always does, but sometimes it does. Um, but generally we would ask people to sort of change things up. And there's several different sort of levers that you can change. So one is you can change the foods that you eat or you can change your sort of fasting style. And that's, um, that's you know, to us, it's usually the, the fasting that gets the change. I mean, sometimes some, it's easier, that's, that's all. Um, and there's different ways you can do that. So if you change, if you decide to work on your sort of foods that you eat, you can change. I mean, no matter what you're eating, you can always make changes, right? Um, and generally that is enough to shake it up. And it's not to say that one diet, uh, like there's certain, general rules but there's lots of different diets out there you can uh you know go carnivore or you can go vegan or you know there's different ways you can go paleo or you can cut out you know uh you know, other things, cut out dairy or something like that. And sometimes these are triggers for people. So it, the, the point is that not one diet is always good for everybody. So one person, and, and this is part of the problem with these sort of uh, people who get into these arguments about diets is that one person says, well, you know, I'm doing this and it's working so good for me. Therefore it must do good for everybody, but that's not true. So a low fat diet does work in a lot of people and a low carb diet does work in a lot of other people. But you get these people who say, well, I did low fat and I did well. So therefore low fat must be good for everybody. But that's not true. Like that's good for you. And if it's good for you, go ahead. I don't really care. What I want to do is try and find what's good for somebody else. Or you could switch and do low carb, or you can do high protein, or you can do low fat, or low, you know, you can do, there's, there's like literally hundreds of different diets out there. So you could change one of those. And, um, and maybe it does better for you. Maybe a low fat diet does better for a little bit. Then you could change it for a little bit. That's just from a purely uh, pragmatic standpoint. So therefore you can change the way that you fast and you can either change it by the way you time it. So instead of uh, going, say you, say you do a one meal a day and you go dinner to dinner, well, you can go breakfast to breakfast. I mean, that's a perfectly legitimate switch and it's still a 24 hour fast. You can change it up. So instead of going 24 hours all the time, you can alternate say between 18 and 36 hours. So do, uh, you know, change that up. So you're still sort of averaging the same amount but you're doing short and long, short and long, just like you would do with exercise. So if you yeah. do exercise, well, the biggest thing that everybody found now is super, super effective is high intensity, high intensity interval training. Well, this is what fasting is. You're trying to change it up so that your body doesn't get used to it. So if you're jogging at a certain pace, like you get better, you get better, then boom, you get that plateau too where you just flatten out, you're not getting faster, you're not getting slower, but you're not getting a lot better. And I got interested in this because uh, one of the new things that we learned in the 2000s, and it wasn't an issue, nobody ever talked about this in the 90s, was that cancer is an obesity related disease. And that's uh, become, you know, as we've had this epidemic, it's become clear, more and more clear that this is the case. So um, the first uh, big acceptance of this wasn't actually till about 2003 when the big, um, the big uh, studies started to come out showing that obesity is actually a huge risk factor for all kinds of cancers. Now it's well accepted. It's actually um, about, you know, almost on par with tobacco as, as a sort of contributor to cancers. So really a large uh, contributor there. And that's how I got interested in this uh, question of what, how, how obesity, that, you know, because I'm dealing with a lot of obesity, that's how I got interested in the question of cancer. Turns out 
that the cancer question is actually far more interesting and complex than I had thought, which is where this book takes a bit of a different turn. So it's not mere, it's not just about nutrition. So it does talk about nutrition and fasting and cancer, but the, the first sort of half of the book is really a discussion about what cancer is as a disease. And um, it's not what we thought it was, because obviously it's not just obesity, right? If you smoke, you get lung cancer and that has nothing to do with obesity. So why, why do we get cancer? Like what is cancer? And that's the real important question that again, we never ask. So it's just like we talk about obesity, what causes weight gain? We never think about that because we think it's all about calories, right? Um, this is the same question, what is cancer? And, and this is where uh, we've actually made a lot of changes that people have not probably recognized. So I sort of go through the history of the way we think about cancer, that is um, not as different diseases, but as a single disease, um, because the different cancers are quite different. Breast cancer is different than a melanoma, which is different from liver cancer. So they're different, but in, since about 2000, people have started to look at how cancers behave as a group. And that's led to some real revolutions in the way we think about cancer, which is leading to real revolutions in the way we treat cancer. So I sort of detail there's how there's sort of been three big revolutions in the, the, the paradigm that the understanding of cancer. So we started out by thinking of cancer as a disease of excessive growth. So you have a cell grows too much, right? So you have a lung cancer, uh, which is, starts as a cell, turns into a cancer, grows too much, and then spreads, right? So it's just a, a cell that grows too much. And that paradigm of cancer leads you to the logical treatment. If cancer is too much growth, kill it. That's the bottom line. So you develop things like surgery, so you cut it out. You develop things like radiation, where you burn it. Or you develop things like chemotherapy, where it is a poison. It's a selective toxin to the cancer. So cutting, burning, and poisoning. It's it, it worked great. Like, honestly, it was a huge sort of leap forward in treatment. Before that, there was no treatment. After that, there was all this treatment. So a lot of cancers got better. It's still the backbone of our therapy today. It's cell that grows too much, kill it. But this paradigm started to reach its limits by the 70s because we had already done the studies, looked for these poisons, looked for different ways to use radiation and all this sort of stuff. But we're the lim reaching the limits of how far that paradigm of understanding. And again, this was a huge revolution. So through the 70s to the 2010s, probably, it was sort of the dominant paradigm of cancer. It's a genetic disease. And what happens, of course, is that now you can develop new treatments that attack this new paradigm. So instead of developing drugs that are just indiscriminate killers of cells, you can now design drugs that, that correct the genes that cause too much growth. And this, the first few drugs that came out, so there's one called imatinib, there's another one called trastuzumab for breast cancer, were just like revolutionary. Like the late 90s, people were like, you know, this is incredible because you could give these drugs without a lot of side effects because, you know, these drugs were changing these genetics. They weren't indiscriminate killers of cells. So then what happened, of course, is that the, with, the, with these first couple of drugs, everybody was like, wow, we're going to cure cancer. This was the sort of prevailing thought by the 2000s. All we need to do is figure out the two or three mutations that are critical for, for these different types of cancers develop the couple of drugs to fix them and boom, you've cured cancer. So you're going to develop one for breast cancer. You're going to develop one for cervical cancer. You're going to do this. And that. So the problem was that, and this was called the two hit hypothesis. That is that you had a couple of genes that were critical and you hit two of them. And the reason that smoke, for example, tobacco smoke was causing cancer was not that it's a targeted gene damage, but it was that if you have a lot of damage by chance, you'll get more likely get those two that hit. Um, but the problem was that we, we, we looked for these genes. So we did the human genome project in the 2000s. We mapped the genome of an entire human being. And then uh, we, didn't, we weren't much closer. So then we did the, the cancer genome atlas, which was uh, an even more ambitious thing. Instead of looking at the genes of one human, we we're going to look at 
cancer cells. And we were going to, we had like 33,000 different genomes and you just compare them and figure out which ones are good or bad. So the problem was that at last count in 2018, we identified about 6 million different gene mutations in cancers. So cancer didn't have one or two gene mutations. It had like a hundred. So if you had, uh, you know, a cancer clinic, so somebody with colon cancer, patient A with colon cancer, he had a hundred different mutations and patient B sitting next to him uh, with colon cancer had a hundred mutations that were actually completely different from, from his neighbor. So this of course made it impossible to go any further with this genetic uh, sort of paradigm because you can't develop a hundred drugs for patient A and a different hundred drugs for patient B, even assuming you could afford it and they had no toxic side effects. So that brought cancer progress in cancer medicine basically to a screeching halt. So this paradigm that we had used to look at cancer, which we were developing drugs, these genetic targeted drugs, really didn't work. Like the number of drugs that have been developed and useful are like, you know, you count on one hand probably. And this is after 30 years of good research. Like, like we spent a lot of money on research. And, and this is where we were sort of in 2010 sort of thing where we're making no progress. The paradigm we're using to understand cancer is not useful. And again, you have to go one step deeper in understanding to say, okay, well, we know that there are genes that are being mutated, which cause excessive growth. Okay, we know that, that's true. But what is causing these genes to be mutated? So the big premise of the, the, the second paradigm was that it's all random. But there's nothing random about these mutations. Cancer develops, so patient A, patient B, they've developed that cancer independently right? They, they, they had nothing to do with each other. And you can look at, say, patient A, say, you know, living in 1920 in Japan and patient B with the same cancer, you know, living in 2020 in North America, right? So separated by half a world, by a century apart, those two cancers will look identical. They weren't random. It was not a random change. So what is it that has been causing it? And this is where we are in the, in the midst of a third great revolution in sort of understanding cancer, which is that this is an evolutionary disease and primarily an ecological disease. That is, there's something guiding these mutations and it's actually a uh, evolutionary process, uh, which is predominantly a response to injury. So when you have a chronic sublethal injury, your body responds in a certain way and the cell, so if you have a chronic injury like tobacco smoke your lung cells some will die because of the injury some will be okay because they didn't get that much injury but in between there's this uh chronic sublethal damage and what that does is from an evolutionary standpoint act as a selective pressure for these cells to become more sort of independent and sort of survivalist. They need to survive at all costs because they're dealing with this chronic sublethal injury. And that's what leading them to act more in their own interest than the interest of the entire environment, which is just like, you know, the lung cells have certain rules to be a lung cell. And that lung cell has sort of under this selective pressure has evolved differently to become more independent. So it will grow, it becomes immortal, it starts to move around where other cells don't. And that's what the cancer is. It's an evolutionary process. So that's the sort of uh, really interesting part about cancer. And, um, and then, you know, once you understand that and you say, okay, well, cancer is actually not a a uh, rare disease. It's actually a very common disease, um, you know, affects one in 10 Americans, that kind of thing. So therefore, if it's such a common disease, then it's not that cancer cells, like the seed of cancer is always there because the seed of cancer is the same in all our cells. What is it about the soil? What is it that is allowing these cells to turn into cancer. So again, you have to identify the cause. In that case, it's tobacco smoke, get rid of the tobacco smoke. In other cases like breast cancer, um, you know that if you move from Japan, for example, to America, your risk of breast cancer actually like triples. So it's not the genetics of it because that 
that the, the, the genetics has stayed the same It's the environment. And one of those things is insulin. Insulin plays a huge role in facilitating the growth of certain types of cancer. So breast cancer is a classic example where it has, you know, six times the amount of insulin receptors. And uh, the reason why is that it, it allows with insulin receptors allows it to kind of get a lot of glucose. And that's one of the things that you can now exploit and say, well, maybe you can, you, you know, try to reduce the hyperinsulinemia, which is what causes the obesity. If you reduce the hyperinsulinemia, you're also going to put these breast cancer cells at a disadvantage compared to a regular breast cell. You're removing some of that fertile soil that allows the seed to grow.